Hi, my name's Will, and today I'm going to show you how to be a full stack Java developer without writing JavaScript. So, I'm going to assume that you're a Java developer and that you'd like to build websites, but you don't really want to work in the JavaScript ecosystem. You want to stick in the Java ecosystem. So, you want to work with things like Maven, you want to write Java code, you like writing HTML and CSS is fine, but when you start looking at having to fold in NPM and the JavaScript tooling, you wind up having to maintain two different code bases. What you don't really want to do is be in a situation where you're having to run a Java Spring Boot app and it's just doing JSON services work, and then you have a completely separate JavaScript framework, and then you're constantly trying to keep those two things in sync. Let's say instead you want to build a high performance app, you want to use Java to do it, you'd like to be able to update the page dynamically like you would with JavaScript app, but you don't want to have to deal with that tool chain. Okay, so the thing that makes this all work is a framework called HTMX, and what we'll see here is an example. We just load in this script and then for the HTMX JavaScript itself, and what it does is it looks at a bunch of additional attributes that you can add to your HTML and then dynamically update a portion of the page. What this is saying here is, in this case, if I've got this button and I click on it, I just want to go ahead and swap out the content. So before we go into the Java examples, I'm just going to show you some of the examples up here. So let's say that we want to add in a um, very simple um, infinite scroll. So the way this works is here we want to be as you scroll this page is it goes ahead and it loads additional data and it'll keep doing it forever the way this works is we're just saying here's our row and go ahead and call make get requests whenever something's revealed and then swap at to the end so that's all the changes that we have to make to html in order to enable this and what we're doing here is we're using a, a get to fetch the additional data. It's um, sending back uh, HTML that just gets added into the DOM as we scroll along. It's really simple, easy way to do this. Let's go ahead and look at some of the other examples. Here's click to edit. So in this case here, we have a div with an editable page, and then this is the form that comes back, and then it pops it in. So basically when you click this button here, it, fit, it issues a request with the click to edit, and then this is the form that gets put in and then once the form is submitted with the button here it then swaps it back out either with the contact or just with a regular submit and here we can see it working just click on a submit add some things hit submit that's it so the page isn't refreshing just this one little portion of it so as I played around with HTMX, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, it's got lots of tri lots of different triggers for things. It's got animations in it, history, web sockets, tons of stuff, a bunch of which I haven't had a chance to play with yet. But what I wanted to do is be able to take HTMX and then show integrating that in with Spring Boot for the server side. So I went ahead and created a project that I've put up on GitHub to uh, illustrate how this works. So if we go to GitHub and can see my pro my demo project here. So this is my project up on GitHub and what, what I've got here, anybody who wants to pull it down and check it out can, you can use it as a template. What I thought would be fun to do for the rest of the video here is to just do a quick code review to show you how this works and how the Spring Boot side plays with HTMX to give you nice dynamic pages. So let's go ahead and I've got my project open in IntelliJ, but before I do anything here. I'm going to go ahead and just run the app so you can see what, what I'm what I'm actually have built. So I'm just running the Spring Boot app like normal. The only thing that you might notice is that there's a lot less debug noise and that's because I've got login configuration to turn down Spring Boot's usual um, logging noise. And you could see how much faster that launched. Um, uh, when people complain about Spring Boot taking time to launch, just turn off the logging and then it launches a lot faster. All right, so let's go ahead and hit localhost. And here's the app. Um, let's go ahead and look at the piece of code that we're going to tunnel into today, which is the little to-do app. So this is the standard JavaScript um, sort of example app. Um, it's how do you do a to-do list. So this to-do list lets you add things new things and I can also remove stuff cool 
And so the animation's being handled by HTMX. Um, there we go. And if we go ahead and inspect this and we look at the network, I'm going to go ahead and delete this. And you saw a little delete that hit the server and came back. And let's add something. And we hit add. And what we'll see here is that's actually hitting a request to uh, add this little chunk of uh, HTML. And if we click in and look at this, we can actually see a preview of it. So this is because there's a little chunk of HTML. And here's the HTML that's coming back. So if we look at this a little more closely, we'll see that there's nothing else in the page, just the little fragment that's then getting appended in. So that's how our web service from uh, the Spring Boot app is returning a little HTML fragment and putting that in the page. We can see that we were adding things dynamically to the page and changing stuff, but if we like look at the GitHub repo, there's no JavaScript in this uh, project at all. Instead, it's all just Java and HTML and teeny little bit of a, uh, hyperscript, which we'll talk about later. So for the code review, let's go ahead and just start by looking at the Maven project file. So this is just the standard palm. And what we can see here is that we are pulling in the Spring Boot as the base for the project. Spring Boot is the parent. And what we're doing is I've, I did go ahead and fold in some additional dependencies for things like Spring Security and Time Leaf, which is a rendering frame, which is the rendering framework. Because I I did add in a login page, um, there's some stuff related to Spring Security, but we're not going to look at that for this. Um, if you wanted to look at more closely, the Spring Security demo actually shows a little bit of integrating some of HTMX's features with Spring Security, so that way things like if you've logged out of a page and refresh a request, it'll update the whole page nicely. Uh, to when you log out. So most of this is just standard Spring Boot stuff. We added in a uh, time leaf layout dialect so that way I'm able to uh, reuse a lot of the header the header declarations um, in several different pages without repeating myself. And I'm using assert for J assert J for uh, assertions in my test cases. And here are the web jars. So the web jars are the first thing that's that's interesting I think for for a lot of developers who are just have been doing REST services with Java. And basically web jars allows you to suck in anything that's available up on NPM as a Java project. So let's go ahead and just find, um, let's go, go ahead and go to web jars real quick. And what you'll see on web jars, um, so it's Java, it's client side libraries packaged into jar files. And so what that means is, is that like we can go in here and see all sorts of classic packages like jQuery. So here's jQuery, and I can see that if I just copy and paste this in, I can add in a web jar, which will then grab an NPM package and pop it in. So what Slick is, is if I want to add anything else on, on NPM, uh, NPM, if it doesn't have a web jar today, you can just go up here, hit add, pop, it, pop in the NPM information. Uh, let's search for jQuery. And if I wanted to, I could redeploy jQuery 3.6, but I don't actually want to do that right now. But the part of the idea here is that any any NPM package that is out on the net, maybe I want to grab a JavaScript charting package, maybe I want to grab, I don't know, whatever. I can just go ahead and pop in the, the coordinates, and if it's not already available as a web jar, all I have to do is pop this in, and then it will create a jar for me that's managed by Maven, which is great. So that's what this is doing. Now, if you're using Spring Boot with web jars, it will automatically put all the web jars that it downloads onto the path for the browser to be able to load. So let's go ahead and look at that really quick. So here we can see I've got some declarations on the web jar path. And then here I'm referring to the Bootstrap CSS and JavaScript. Here's the HTMX. Um, here's some icons. Right, so I'm basically able to just simply add web jar declarations to my palm. Uh, these are all think packages that would be up on npm, and now they're available in Java, which is pretty cool. So let's go back and or let's go ahead and look through the rest of this palm file. Uh, plugin management is just because I'm a little fussy about making sure I've got the current versions of all the different Maven plugins, and otherwise nothing particularly unusual or interesting. I do have this dependency report generation turned on. Um, so this will tell me when I write, run my site command with Maven if any of my dependencies are out of date, which is pretty nice. Especially with um, web jars and things like that where some of those may be moving pretty quickly. 
It's very nice to see. Now let's look at the project structure a little bit more closely. So most of this is just pretty vanilla Spring Boot stuff. Let's just sort of start from the high level. Um, the demo, I have a bunch of controllers. Um, most of these controllers are just open to the public. I'm not using Spring Security. There is one controller where I show some Spring Security demo stuff. What we're interested in right now is the to-do list. So uh, we'll actually start by just looking at the to-do list um, itself. So basically what we have here is a standard Spring controller. Here I've got the uh, default mapping for the to-do, which is just simply taking the page that comes back and returns the to-do view. And I go ahead and add in um, the current date and time, and then I also, just to show for the rendering, and then I also show I'm just adding in a string for the item. And then it returns the to-do. So I can go ahead and open this up, and this is the HTML for the to-do page. So let's go ahead and start at the top and take a look what we got here. So I do have one little bit of custom CSS for the swap, which is when um, it's that's where you see that little animation, the CSS animation that plays whenever there's an element being removed. The content is, you'll notice I don't have any declarations for the JavaScript or the CSS up here. And that's because I'm actually pulling that stuff in with a content um, fragment. So if we see the document itself is saying to be decorated with layout.html and I can open that up and this is the wrapper for the whole page. So every page in the project uses this same wrapper. So this is where I've got my standard declarations for my view, uh, my CSS and my JavaScript stuff. I do add in a little bit of HTMX specific CSS um, for the indicator. So if there's a slow page load, um, it'll automatically display a little icon. And then here I'm doing some really basic um, setup for a nav bar at the top, a loading indicator. So that's the slow spinning um, circles indicator that would appear if, there, if HTMX was slow to respond. And then here you can see I've got the fragment um, content, page content goes here. So the way this works is, is that when someone hits the page asking for the to-do view, the to-do view set notices that it's being a request to be decorated by the layout HTML file. So that provides the wrapper and then the wrapper kicks in, um, wraps the page back, and then it returns the full page with all the content in it. Specifically, the content fragment here, where it's saying that this is the actual content for the page. So that's what's going on with layouts. Um, it may seem a little confusing, but what it means is that when I'm building out my templates with Timeleaf, I'm able to just build small little page, HTML pages for each view, and then I have one master layout that's controlling everything. Um, and people can you can use these kinds of um, layouts and fragments for things like standardizing your nav bar or your footer or what have you as well. Okay, next up. So that's what that layout up here is. This is the decorator, and then this is saying this is my actual content. So this is just um, the sort of the UI for wrapping it up. Now the part that's kind of interesting here is I have a table with the to-do list. And then I've got a block here, and this is the fragment here that represents the to-do item. So this is just standard timely stuff, but the only thing that you'll notice is that they have, I do have this timely, timely fragment declaration on here. So what I'm saying is, is that this block of HTML is a fragment. So when it's first rendered, that is just ignored. So let's go ahead and... Go to the running app just so we can see what's going on here. Okay, so what happens is when this page is first requested, it goes ahead and it fetch it, it renders this whole view uh, from, and it's getting the data to render this from the controller, including this item. But what, over here we can see it says get stuff done. So here we can see the fragment that is rendering, in this case, this to do item here. But you may notice that it says get groceries over here and the default here is saying get stuff done. And that's because Timeleaf will automatically replace this text with whatever value is being passed into, the, passed into this view. So let's go ahead and look at that controller again a little bit more closely. And what we see is that for when, the, for when the page is first rendered, it's gonna pass stuff in an item get stuff done. And this is just a demo placeholder thing, but then it's gonna return the view, the to-do view. So the first time the page is rendered, it's going to put in this get stuff done. 
Now we can see a couple of one interesting bit of stuff here already, which are these HX attributes. Confirm, target, swap, trigger, and then delete. So what's going on here? Let's go ahead and click this delete button and see what happens. So when I click on the delete button, HTMX confirm is already is what's providing the are you sure confirmation. And so I say sure. Now it goes ahead and deletes it. Um, and if we go ahead and add another thing again, um, here we didn't put anything in. So if I say let's go ahead and add in something. And let's go ahead and look at the inspector so we can see what's actually happening over the network here. When I click on delete, it did actually go ahead and send back this delete, but there's no response. Nothing came back except for the delete, and that was just a delete request. So let's go ahead and look at what happened here. So right now I have nothing. I have a delete on the server, but I actually don't do anything with that. And that's because this is just a demo, but I wanted to show that there was still a server ping for a delete occurring. Now let's go ahead and look at the add. So for the add, I have a little text field input here. That's what this is. And then I have some HTMX on this button. So I'm doing a couple of things. So the first thing is on HTMX after request, put this into the new to do value. So what that's saying is, is that when I click the button, HTML, uh, HyperScript is going to fire up and say that on this button, when it first fires or when it's first initialized, it's saying anytime that a request is sent to HTMX, go ahead and clear out the value in this to do. And that makes sense. That's basically just a little nice uh, utility thing to clear the value out. Now, this is HyperScript, and we can, like I said, we'll come back to that later. And basically, HyperScript is another way of writing JavaScript really cleanly and simply. Um, so it, this is just listening for an event, and then it's going to stuff a value into this uh, to-do item, into this form right up here, the new to-do. Uh, it's got an ID, and then it's saying, here the most interesting part is, when I do a post, go ahead and hit the post URL, and go ahead and include the new to do. So that's this ID here. So it's saying when you click on this button, grab this, this form element and include that into the request, the post that we're doing right here. Um, saying before end, so the target is the to do list. So that's the, the actual list up here. And we're saying before the end. So go ahead and take the HTML that comes back from this post and stick it in up there. And the trigger is the click, and the classes are just, that's just bootstrap stuff. All right, let's go ahead and submit the request. And once again, when, we, when I hit the submit on that, we can see the response down here. And sure enough, we can look at it sent the request, and then it sent a response. And you'll note that the form data, it did include in the form data the hello world from this button. That's interesting because it doesn't actually, it's not even actually wrapped in a form element. Instead, all I'm doing is just clicking on this button and then grabbing this and then submitting the data back. So let's look at the controller and see what's happening. So if we look at the create controller, it's a post. And then what we can see is that it's looking for the new to do um, parameter, which is the same one that we have right here. And then it says, OK, let's go ahead and stick that to do into the model for what we send back. This is the really interesting part here is that when we return, we're saying return to do. So this is just like the controller return up here, except that we're also adding in this little sent fragment declaration. The fragment declaration is what tells Timeleaf, go ahead and fetch just this portion, that fragment. So this is built-in timely functionality. All I have to do is if I want to grab an existing fragment, use that colon colon syntax, and then boom, now I've got it into the page. That's really all there is to it. The controller, all I'm doing is just returning the view, and then when I want to update a fragment, I just return the fragment I want to update. It's not that complicated. The one other last thing is, I do think it's worth taking just a moment. You'll note I used a little bit of HyperScript. So HyperScript is a very simplified language for working with the web. It's in comparison with JavaScript, it's much cleaner and simpler. Uh, let's go ahead and compare some of the JavaScript with uh, vanilla JavaScript, jQuery, and HyperScript really quick. 
So this is an example. Um, this is actually the fade and remove is exactly the thing that we're doing right now. So this is what you would do in regular JavaScript. You'd set a transition, then you'd have to wait for the animation frames to make sure the frame rate's right, and then you go ahead and add in the transition and remove it. So that's how that works. Here's a similar thing written in jQuery where I'm looking for the div to remove, attaching a click function to it with the fade out, and then once the timer finishes, it removes it. And here is the hyperscript version, on click transition opacity to zero, then remove me. Uh, so obviously the hyperscript is much simpler and easier to work with. And part of what I really like about hyperscript is, especially for anything like event handlers or what have you, is that it's async transparent. So I'm not having to worry about handling all the JavaScript async stuff to be able to use it. I can just uh, write really simple little scripts and then I attach them with this underscore. Um, so that's the what that's what HyperScript is looking for for how it attaches HyperScripts to elements on the page. So that is what I am doing on the chunk of HyperScript here. So now that we've seen a little HyperScript, we know that we're adding a button on the button when the button's first initialized. We say the button is going to listen for HTMX after request events, and then it puts that value into the value for this uh, ID. And that's it. So that is a very, very quick demo of using Spring Boot with HTMX to send HTML over the wire and then update your pages live. Now, this was a very, very simple example. It was actually, it's, it's kind of intended to just make it really, really clear what's going on. What's one of the things that's really slick about this is it's extremely easy to test. It's extremely to un easy to understand what's going on. And if you've been working with Java and Timeleaf and all that good stuff before, then you get to stay in all that ecosystem. So one last thing before you go, I wanted to quickly run through the rest of the demos just so you could see what was in the project for the HTMX demo stuff um, and know that you've got a bunch of great stuff that you can crib for your own projects. So I still have the project running, the server running, it's just the Spring Boot run. And then here is the application and over here is IntelliJ with the code. So I'm just going to flip through really quick and show you the other stuff. So for click to edit, um, it's the same thing as the HTMX demo, but this time it's on top of Spring Boot. Click to edit update. Um, that is the most interesting part is the click to edit controller, which you can see is really tiny. And in this case, I'm, I've got a couple of separate forms. Um, it would actually be really easy to just make this one HTML page and then just swap out the pieces. Um, if we go back, let's look at the next one, infinite scroll. So infinite scroll, this is a classic pattern. Um, and basically you want to just be able to let data keep loading. You'll notice I have the indicator in the bottom corner. And the reason that that indicator is kicking in is if we look at infinite scroll, we can see that the, um, in this case, I'm actually just using little snippets of inline HTML, which I wouldn't recommend for anything real, but it does make it simple to follow what's going on. And you'll notice I have a thread sleep kicking off. Um, so that's part of what gives the little indicator time to fire off. So. There you go. Infinite scroll is really easy. It's just appending little chunks of HTML and sending them back, and then it puts those on the end. Really easy to do in Spring Boot. Um, let's go ahead and look at the next one. Uh, we already looked at the to-do list. Uh, the value select is just a way of up doing dynamic updates for what the submenus have. And again, very, very simple. Uh, demo. In this case, the data for the pop-ups just right there, and then it returns it. And this is kind of ugly, but um, it's just a demo. You get the idea. Now, in this case, I'm injecting uh, handlebars, and so it's actually processing this and re returning this back with handlebars, which is a different templating language. Um, handlebars is, is got support across a huge variety of languages, so if you want the most sort of standard templating language that you can flop around between different languages, um, Handlebar is a good pick. Uh, Timeleaf is more Java-centric and has support in Spring Boot for a lot of extra features. Um, so it's just kind of a decision on what you want to go with there. 
Um, and so Spring Security Integration, uh, that one allows you to go through a little sign-in process and then you can see that if you uh, refresh um, a chunk of the page and that the session's expired, it goes ahead and kicks you back to the login page, um, which that's probably worth another whole separate video. But the last one I wanted to show you, which is really interesting, I think, is the um, UI demo. So this is basically every single Spring Boot UI control out of the box, um, but it's implemented um, with this pretty simple controller here. And what it's doing is, is it's illustrating the ways to pass in whatever's happening over here into um, a format that Spring Boot knows how to process. Um, so for example, um, like select multiple. So this is an example here. So right here I've got one, two, three, and I can hold and shift or uh, command click on a Mac and I can select different things. And you can see down here it's showing what's been selected. So this is showing how this UI control is bound live to whatever's going on in the Spring uh, Boot Controller. So that's pretty slick. And we can see that um, in a few cases we've got things like a color picker. And so once I pick a color, now it's actually converting that to hex and RGB. So if we look down here, we can actually see I've got um, a color string and then I'm actually using some built-in Java stuff to transform that color, the hex value that comes back into the RGB values. It's pretty cool. Uh, here's one that's a classic uh, f file picker. So there we go. I can see some of my, some of my headshots. So I'm just going to go ahead and pick my headshot. And when I see that, I can see that I actually went ahead and uploaded it live. So I'm doing all that with ju just simple JavaScript stuff. And if we look over here, we can actually see the uh, Spring Boot to be able to handle the file upload. So there's a bunch of other things like, um, for example, telephone. So that's going to set the value, but that would not validate um, when I hit, hit the submit button. So here I can see I've submitted the form and it sent all these values back. I don't have the validation turned on all of this stuff, but get an idea what's coming back. So that is pretty cool. Um, check switches. This is an inter intermediate inter indeterminate checkbox. So I've got sample showing how to do that. Um, some cool stuff. So there you go. That's a quick overview of the, all the different things that are in the Spring Boot demo package up on GitHub, and uh, feel free to go up and grab everything for your own projects. So, I hope you like the video. Uh, if you do, you know what to do about likes and subscribes and all that fun stuff. Hope to catch you later.